very, uh, very honored to be here today. So thank you uh, to CoLab and the Center uh, for Architecture and Design, and of course to Design Philadelphia to continuing to uh, put on this great festival in Philadelphia. Um, ours is a Philadelphia story. It's one of grit and survival, reinvention and humility. Um, ours is also a story that serves as just another example of the good things that do happen in Philadelphia. It's, an under, it's a uh, story that's underscored uh, by belief in the freedom and the power of design and underpinned by creative thinking and the possibilities that come from getting people to see opportunities and challenges differently. The only reason that I'm here today and the only reason that Amunil still exists is that we took a chance in ourselves. We hold to a belief that freedom and power comes from the ability to design that we brought design and creativity into our everyday vocabulary. And that we managed to maintain a sense of optimism in the face of challenges. This is our first pandemic, but it's not our first crisis. We faced the death of our founder. We found our way back from the edge of bankruptcy more than once. We witnessed changes in technology that decimated our markets. And we survived each recession and downward cycle since 1965. And we have the scars to prove it. Those who have been here long enough, this survival hasn't come without great sacrifice, but it bonded us with these amazing survival instincts and a poor short-term memory for pain. This idea that um, design optimism exists is, she is seen in our sort of audacity, this belief that we can change our own destiny that we can make our own luck, that we can change perceptions both inside of the company and out, and that even though we'll, we know we'll make mistakes along the way, we can still reach our goals. Design optimism keeps us hopeful, it keeps us inspired, and it keeps us pushing forward. In 1991, I was a sophomore in college. I got a phone call in the middle of the day from my mother, and she wasn't really calling as my mom. She was calling purely as the chairman of Amunil, the co-founder of Amunil, and the ultimate protector of Amunil. The, um, at the time, Larry Malton had been brought in by my mother and with the advice of uh, my father's mentor to help take the business over after my father had passed away. And he wanted to buy the business. And um, I had to decide, was I OK with that? Um, I needed to let my mom know, uh, would I regret it never having had a chance to go into the business? And she gave me a week to make the decision. And I was 19 years old. In 2015, we celebrated Amuel's 50th anniversary. I got to stand up in front of our employees, about 150 of them at the time, and tell the story of the founding of the business. I got to talk about my mother, this you know, second grade teacher, and my father, this sort of dynamic sales guy who was working for an electronics company, and um, tell how when they got married, my mother told my father, Let's start a business before we have children. I don't want our family to be dependent on anybody else. And they sought out to figure out what that business might be, what would support a family. And at the same time, working for his um, mentor and his boss at the time, my father had the idea that in addition to the electronic components that he was selling for him, cathode ray tubes, motors, power supplies, that he could also um, distribute magnetic shielding. So he sort of figured out who the best uh, shielding supplier was at the time, and he went to his, his boss and said, hey, I think we should do this. And he said, great, sounds great. So he set up a meeting. They went to New York, my mother and father. They checked into a uh, sort of a fancy hotel and went down for dinner a little bit later. And uh, they sat there with my mother, father, and, and uh, the gentleman who owned this shielding company at the time and his wife. And my father was excited. He started to talk about the story, sort of talk about like how he thought this could work, where they could distribute shields and, and really help build the business. 
And this gentleman just stopped him. He put his hand up in my father's face and said, Sai, we don't talk business in front of women. And that was all my mom needed to hear. <laughs> she, you have to imagine this five foot tall woman jumping up when nothing was said and leaving the table, going upstairs to her hotel room and um, starting to pack her bag. She's thinking, maybe this isn't the guy for me. And um, a couple minutes later, my father comes to the door and had to knock because of course my mom had the keys. And my mother came and opened the door and said, Sai, what do you have to say for yourself? And he stood there smiling and said, do you want to put him out of business? And that was how Amino was founded. It wasn't um, born from a love of magnetic shielding. It wasn't born for a passion for physics or the uh, sort of mechanisms that govern the need for shielding. But it was born by a need, uh, the desire to have their own business, and a little bit of spite. And in uh, preparation for the 50th anniversary, I got to dig through the archives. I got to dig through my father's old filing cabinets that had been up in the attic, and I had never sort of made the, the chance to go through them. And when I was going through the archive, all these stories I'd heard over the years became tangible. I saw these three by five uh, index cards that were um, sent out. My father's mentor had let him send out uh, a survey in every shipment to find out if people were needing shielding, if they made their own or if they bought them, if they had any interest, how much were they spending on them a year. And they compiled enough of these that they felt comfortable writing a business plan and getting a uh, small business uh, administration loan application in. And I got to see the application. I saw the budget. I saw these, um, you know, everything on this list for all the tools, equipment, including the used typewriters and used adding machines that they were going to uh, need to start this business. And they got their loan and they rented the back of a warehouse and they started Amunil. And they started it really from the ground up. And um, it wasn't easy because even though they had to learn everything, the hard part was learning how to find customers and learning that in shielding, Nobody's looking for you. They only find you when their products aren't working. And it took almost a year to get their first client. And in that time, they got uh, evicted from their apartment. They had to make a decision whether to abandon this plan or to stick with it. And they moved into the back of the warehouse, my mother, my father, their dog, and eventually got their first client. And with that client came another and ultimately, my mother was able to leave the business and start the family. And I got to tell the story, and I got to sort of tell it in front of all of our employees, in front of my mother, and uh, our employees who maybe hadn't been there that long, who hadn't even met her, um, got to hear this um, incredible uh, story and understand why when we talk about things at Amino, we talk about them uh, as being a family. We talk about this uh, sort of dedication and passion for what we do. And I think at that moment and being surrounded by the um, artifacts and my mother, they understood why it always does feel so personal. When I started um, full time in 1993, I really didn't have any idea what was in store for me. I started as a uh, sales engineer and I was uh, working to learn the business, and I was calling on customers we had lost since my father's passing. In those days, we had been put into um, secured lending by the bank. We had uh, to learn some really difficult lessons, and one of them is a lesson that everybody should learn. You need to um, sell more, make more money, then you're spending. It's a pretty basic uh, equation when you look back on it, but it was one that we had a hard time with. Um, and in my first three months, you know, we weren't able to make payroll and our credit line was maxed out. And I started to learn what um, real fear felt like. And we were given two choices by our accountant. Um, we either had to re increase revenues very quickly or decrease expenses very quickly. And um, 
we didn't know how to increase revenue quickly. That was always our challenge. Um, so after um, some deliberation and a bunch of sleepless nights, uh, we ended up laying off 60 out of our 90 employees. And these were employees that I had known since I was a child going to visit my father at work. I was 23 years old and I was changed forever. I started to understand the truth about business and business ownership that no matter what heights we would ever reach, I still remember those days so vividly. Uh, I found that in my career, people don't always talk about this stuff. They don't uh, share how dark and how cold, how isolating it can feel, but it's very real. And it's also very important to remember. It, it's important to remind ourselves, not just how far we've come, but how fortunate we are and how hard we have to continue to fight never to get back to that place again. But once we accepted the loss, the failure that we weren't able to support the full complement of our employees, we were able to move forward and focus on the future. I found that in the shadow of these moments, we've always gained a level of creative freedom and a latitude to question things that we otherwise would rarely enjoy. And after that day, I started to look bigger started looking at non-traditional spaces for shielding requirements. We started to call on universities and government labs more proactively. We started to uh, travel around the country to different trade, trade shows and eventually around the world. And we started bidding on non-shielding components from our existing shielding clients. Um, and we were gaining traction. We were getting new work. We were getting new clients. We even got a uh, patent on a magnetic shield to protect credit cards from becoming erased. But with all of that, with all of the new opportunities we were seeing, our overall market for shielding was actually shrinking at a faster rate than what we were building. At that point in those days, 85% of our business involved cathode ray tubes. These are the picture tubes for video displays, the kinds that you would see in cockpits for fighter planes or even commercial aircraft. Uh, in hospitals, on trading room floors for stock trading. And they were being replaced by flat paddle monitors, the kinds of monitors that we all own today and which unfortunately don't require shielding. And I remember feeling helpless that no matter how hard we worked, how low we got our pricing, how many you know, weeks we would spend on the road, that we could still fail. And I didn't want to be the kid that killed the family business. We had to find a new way to grow we had to continue to look for new technologies that needed shielding, but we also needed to do something completely different. I found sort of in my path that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And um, in this case, it came in the form of a statement on a friend's website. And I remember being um, at home, sitting at my desk, checking out his website, and reading along this whole list of things that inspired him was this notion that creativity drives commerce. And it resonated with me. This idea that we had to think more creatively, not just bigger, but maybe completely differently than we had thought about ourselves before. Maybe beyond looking at ourselves as just a shielding uh, fabrication company, we had to look at what we were truly great at. And we had to think about the core competencies that we really did possess, this idea that we could manufacture these incredibly tight tolerance uh, components that would fit into uh, already existing envelopes, that we could spend all of this time and quickly engineer things because when our customers would come to us, it was typically because their products were already failing and we were what was holding them up from going to market. So we learned to engineer quickly. We learned to engineer complex assemblies in, in, uh, for low quantities. And we started to look at that unique set of skills and, and it hit me that there were other markets that we could take that to. And I sat and started to write a uh, business plan. And um, the, the heading on the plan was growth through diversification. This idea that we could take these core competencies and take them to other diverse markets, markets that would have different economic cycles than magnetic shielding and different ways of doing business in terms of the speed to market. We, I wrote about uh, fabrication for 
the retail industry, for hospitality, for commercial offices and high-end residential spaces. And I wrote it with such conviction that at the end I was like, oh, this is obvious. This will be a straight path to success. But there was just one problem, right? We had never made anything other than a magnetic shield before. And we didn't have any way to show our capabilities, not even to start a conversation. So that became our first problem to solve. This idea that we had to uh, create our own narrative. We needed tangible proof of our capabilities. Uh, we needed a product. So I reached out to some friends and asked for their help and said, listen, you know, here are the things we can do. Here are the, here's the equipment we have, the types of things we can make, but can you help design some furniture for us? And um, they came back and, and we got into to action and we started to make a line of furniture. And you know, looking back, it, it looked a lot like what you would think a magnetic shielding company might make for furniture as a first go round, but it worked. With that furniture line, we were able to get into uh, small regional furniture shows. We were able to start to um, see some level of success. And in that day, in those days, um, success was measured by getting orders. And we would come in after the weekend and there would be, you know, unroll this fax paper. Our first year we were in a hundred different furniture stores across the country. And um, the, our big break really came when we decided to um, sort of reinvent the furniture a bit. And we wanted to apply to ICFF in New York. And uh, when we got accepted into that show, that was really a turning point for us. It was um, a turning point because we were going to um, meet people that we had never met before. We were going to get to be seen with products that would represent us, maybe represent us better than our sort of initial offerings had. But um, we also knew that we were going to be judged by everything we showed, that every single detail, every decision was going to define us in the eyes of our audience. That um, the materials we worked with, the way that we presented them was going to either attract um, architects and designers to us or we were just going to look like everybody else. So over time we started to look at these booths as being autobiographical. Um, we created these installations that represented us and allowed us to take authorship for the first time. Each year we were given new opportunities uh, and each year we took on more and more projects and we would come back to New York the following year with bigger, bolder, more confident displays. And again, uh, without ever giving up a chance to surprise the audience. And inside of Amunil, ICFF became everything. It was equal parts chaos and pride, and we continued to push ourselves to stretch it, ourselves in design. We started to um, think about how we were engineering uh, and for fabrication. We started to uh, spend thousands of hours building these incredible structures in these booths. And of course, because we were already making things for our, our clients, we had to shoehorn all of this into a, a much tighter time frame. And it required absolute dedication, absolute heroics. We were warriors. We knew that talent alone wasn't going to get us to where we needed to be. We knew that if we wanted this, if we really, really wanted to change our future, that we needed to work and work harder than anybody else was prepared to work. And we assembled a team of artists, of designers, frustrated architects, engineers, and super skilled fabricators to create this collective whole that would give us the ability to accomplish anything. There's a quote that I've always loved. If you want to build a ship, don't drum people up to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And that's what we've used to guide us. We know we work hard, but we want people to work together towards this vision that we have. We, uh, we need people to have a internal drive, uh, to be intellectually curious, 
to learn and to continue to learn and to bring a true passion to what they're doing, almost a, a calling to push and discover and to create and to know that anything can be accomplished. In those days, this is before social media, so before Pinterest, before Instagram, um, really early web, the best architects and the best designers and the best brands would come to these shows and they would uh, be looking for um, things to inspire them. They were looking things to bring back to their clients. They were looking for um, partners to help them realize their vision. And um, when we got to um, meet these clients, because they oftentimes had never heard of us, still today we meet people all the time who've never heard of us, but in those days we were getting chances because everybody else that they already knew, everybody else that they had uh, depended on before had said no, right? So we were... Um, getting jobs because other people couldn't do it in the time frame, perhaps. They couldn't do it for the budget. Maybe there wasn't enough definition around it. Maybe it just seemed impossible. And we didn't care. The truth is we were hungry. We designed these booths to create opportunities to stand out and start making a name for ourselves. And uh, each new order that we got, each new opportunity was met with total enthusiasm. And after not being able to get new orders for years, we were really starting to deliver on our promise. We were um, building these deepening relationships. And uh, we had a minimum order in those days of $100. And our first orders never really got much over $1,000. But it didn't matter because they were new. And those uh, customers kept coming with new things time after time and building into significant customers. And during that time, we earned a reputation for being a company that could really do anything or make anything, at least in metal, and that we were willing to take on projects that other people weren't. Within the first few years of doing ICFF, the composition of our business changed so significantly that magnetic shielding accounted for just over 30% of our annual revenues. Our earliest projects were from retail brands and we were doing everything for them from window displays to signage to full fixture packages. And then we started to work for hotels and restaurants, public art projects uh, all around the country. There's a uh, quote from Richard Branson that if somebody offers you an amazing opportunity but you are not sure if you can do it, say yes and then learn how to do it later. We grew because we kept saying yes, especially if they had been told no by others and then they decided not to give up. We said yes because we knew we'd figure it out. That was the start of our education. We learned how to work with materials that we'd never worked with before. We learned how to engineer things so you couldn't tell that it, how it had been made. And we also learned how to engineer things so it would still leave some evidence of hand. We learned about function and standards, rigging, installation requirements, structural engineering, and we became more expert in anything that would give us a competitive edge. In these days, we felt fortunate to be getting a shot at all. So whatever we could find, we, were, we would do. This idea that we would fail, this idea that we wouldn't deliver, to us meant we wouldn't get a second chance. So everything felt like life or death. When we heard that people were upset with a lack of um, sort of authentic finishes in the marketplace, things that would make their products feel uh, right in their space, we started to put our focus there. And we started to, to earn a reputation for being um, able to bring a level of artistry and artisan finishes even in uh, production quantities. And each successful project freed us to take on the next challenge. Each completed project built to more credibility and made telling our story that much more tangible for prospective clients. Saying yes was working. By 2008, Amino was named to Inc. Magazine's list of fastest growing inner city businesses. 
they described us as making shields for space shuttles and furniture. And honestly, that was about right at the time. We were learning so much. By our second or third project, for a client, they would bring us into the projects during the design ideation phase. I think that we were there just to keep them out of trouble, you know, from a material perspective or what was going to be possible from budget. But we were just happy to be there. We listened. We really tried to uh, absorb everything that we could. If they made a reference that we didn't understand, if they talked about a, a hotel they had visited, a brand that we didn't know, an architect or an artist, a fashion designer, after that meeting, we would research it. We would dig it up. We would find the book. We would read the magazines. We'd devour it. We would um, do whatever it took to make sure we understood what inspired our customers and then make sure we could understand what might come next for them. We looked for ways to contribute, to add value to the process. And we were getting to work with these amazing clients. We were working with uh, brands like Dongia and Barney's and W Hotel and Calvin Klein, uh, architects like SOM and um, uh, Rockwell Group, designers like Roman Williams, Annabelle Seldorf, just people that were on the cover of every magazine that we would read. and. Um, in doing so, you know, we were talking to these people at two o'clock in the morning when they were overseas and um, looking for an answer. And we started to develop personal relationships with them, which led to our confidence to bring more things to bear in these meetings. So we started to meekly at first and more boldly later sort of offer our inspirations and ideas. We would find treasures at flea markets and we'd bring them back thinking, oh, maybe they needed to be buffed and repatinaed. And um, we'd bring you know, photos of old machinery details, or maybe a knob from a uh, microscope. And um, we'd offer them as a solution to a design problem, a, a detail. And sometimes they would look at us like, oh, you guys are so cute. You're the dumb little fabricators, but that's nice. And sometimes they would welcome them. You know, they would bring us in, and when they did, they just made us a bigger part of their team. You know, we started to understand them and we started to understand their personality and how they were trying to, di to differentiate themselves. So we'd find something and say, oh, this is a perfect inspiration for this architect or this would be great for this project. And we started to um, send them uh, these images or even the actual objects uh, in advance of a meeting. And eventually collecting became sort of like a justified hobby. Um, this process helped me to start to find inspirations for ourselves and for our brand. Our collecting and collection started to f inform our aesthetic. One that dovetailed with our capabilities and that seemed to fill a need for our clients. I found myself um, turning to these objects for inspiration. We're trying to find a wood finish. Oh, maybe the way that this handle from this old screwdriver that's 100 years old might do the trick. And um, we would find details um, on a piece we'd had for a year, but didn't know what we were going to get from it until the need arrived. And towards the end of 2013, um, when we were working on uh, sort of, I'm going to say our thousandth shelving unit for one of our clients, we decided, hey, let's, let's actually design something for ourselves from scratch. And, um, we started to um, think about a system that could be ours that would make sense with the things that inspired us, this sort of um, uh, affinity for uh, mechanisms and authenticity materials and things that were pragmatic and still beautiful. And um, we had two requirements when we started to, to design this. One was that it needed to be flexible. It needed to be able to be you know, morphed and changed for our different clients and different applications. And the second was that it had to be really easy to style and um, curate. So I started to do some sketches and met with my team and they started to do better sketches. And then we got to a good place and we went out and started to 3D print these um, components. 
And this is all in one day. And then by the end of the day, we had our first mock-up, um, mocked up with you know, raw steel tube and 3D printed fittings. But we stood back and there was the first version of our collector shelving system. And we ended up um, building some. And uh, we didn't have a customer, obviously, but we built them for ourselves and we took them over to a uh, building that I had on uh, North American Street in Philadelphia. And we did a photo shoot and we, you know, brought this sort of machine brass shelving unit into this beautifully romantic uh, raw space. And we brought the requisite design books because you have to have design books when you're styling for a photo shoot. And um, some of our found objects and we started to style these and the shelving systems looked beautiful and the space looked great. And I looked at it as the light was coming in through the windows and, and thinking, God, maybe this is what we should be doing. Maybe, maybe having a space where people can come see our products or where they can accidentally see them uh, could be more powerful or as powerful as, as what was happening for us at ICFF in four days out of the year. Maybe this is something that could happen 365 days a year. But we only had one product. And I knew that a... Um, an Amunil showroom at that point would have felt uh, premature. They would have all felt sort of one note. And um, at that point, I'd met some other sort of like-minded designers, makers, business owners in Philadelphia that unlike uh, people I had met earlier in my career, this group were really sort of kindred. They were inspired by the th same things that we were inspired by, not just uh, in terms of aesthetics, but in terms of uh, the way we're trying to live our lives and the way that we wanted to run our businesses. And um, as we started to drive that 15 minute drive from American Street back to my office at Amunil, I made a call, I made two calls or three calls. I called Robert from Robert True Ogden and Lostine. I called uh, Brian Foster and Ernie Seskin from Groundwork Home. And I asked them, I said, if you guys, um, uh, if I wanted to build this uh, showroom, would you guys do it with me? And uh, by the time I got back to the office, we had a plan. It was, you know, middle of June at that point, and we had a plan that was going to get us open by July, uh, I'm sorry, by September for uh, Design Philadelphia. So here we are, sort of full circle. Um, and that we were going to have it filled with the products from each of our companies, but also the found objects from each of our collections. Uh, that inspired those products and inspired us. And um, American Street really changed the game for us. It um, allowed us to show our clients the kind of space we would curate, um, what inspired us. But it also gave us a different um, mission when our clients would come in from all over the country. You know, they would come in because they needed to see the factory. They needed to see their projects in process. They um, uh, would fly into Philadelphia from across the country or they'd take the train down from New York. And it was always sort of how quickly can I get in and out of that visit? And all of a sudden now we were scheduling them in there for longer. We wanted to bring them in, have a meal with them. You know, when we were talking about this show, when the first thing we did was decide to take the smokestack off the roof and build a wood fired oven in it so we could entertain our uh, clients, we would force a, sort of a punctuated pause. And we would sit there in this sort of relaxed, casual environment, and we would um, sort of talk about where the different pieces came from. Um, they would ask, like, you know, what, where, what's going on here? Like, wh I don't understand what, like, how you got from A to, to Z. And um, our new clients, clients that were seeing us for the first time, were just excited because they saw the possibilities. And our... Um, older clients just started to reframe how they thought about us. They started to see us as a, a, a partner, but in a much deeper way. So clients that we had, clients like um, Saks Fifth Avenue and Bose would hire us to design shops in hundreds of their stores. And um, we would curate them. We would found objects with uh, artwork, with furniture that we'd make specifically for them but we got to bring these designs to bear. And um, the process 
felt different. It was different internally. We took, I won't say we took more pride, but we felt more pressure. We felt the pressure to deliver sort of from every aspect of it. And um, it also gave us a chance, American Street, to meet local designers because we had never really been able to connect with the local design community. And that was the first time that we got to meet them, uh, share experiences with them. Um, we got to promote other local artists, other local designers. Um, so it was a way to um, sort of feel much more uh, connected, not only to what we were doing, but where we were doing it. And at the same time, my uh, wife Kim and I started to work on the renovation for our home. And we weren't going to do that without our, you know, longtime friend and sort of local design treasure, R.J. Thornburg. And the three of us started to work on the design of the house together. And uh, as R.J. started working on the sort of the plan in the space and the programming um, and started to pull inspirations, we realized that this had to be a lab. We had to create it like a, a test ground for products. If we were really going to continue to to bring products to market, we needed to live with them. I mean, literally live with them. We needed to know what they felt like, how they aged, how they wore. We needed to know what it felt like to build and install a kitchen. We needed to understand how we could make um, stair systems that could be used in both residential. It's a gritty town, Philadelphia. Residential and commercial spaces. And, um, you know, light fixtures, everything. And this uh, project for us really became the um, uh, culmination or this sort of visual manifestation of where we were going. And um, working with RJ was really uh, effortless and um, seemed to move between sort of these little details and the big picture so, um, eff so sort of easily that um, we decided well, if we can do this for our, ourselves, we can also do this for our clients. So as our clients were coming to us to um, ask us to design their spaces or design products, we started to bring RJ into that process with us as well. And um, whether it's things we were doing for somebody's home or their offices, restaurant, um, it really just uh, became a game changer for us. And um, that process... Uh, really gave us the confidence to um, pivot again. So by the end of 2014, our sales were roughly 50-50. And um, I had mentioned before that our um, business plan that I'd written was this idea of growth through, through diversification. And I think one of the misconceptions is that we think of design as uh, the literal uh, design of these creative things that we're making, but it's not, it's the, it's the solving of a problem. And at that point, our business just wasn't diverse enough. And in growing this sort of furniture and fixtures and design business, we were also growing new markets and new avenues for our shielding business. So by the end of 2014, um, you know, we had these, uh, this business that was much larger than it had ever been and it was equal parts technical products and uh, products we were making for the architectural and design community. And I remember sitting at home that, uh, uh, that holiday season, sort of, you know, uh, we, we would shut down for a little bit between Christmas and New Year's, and I just felt beaten up, um, exhausted. And I, you know, we had reached these sort of record levels of sales, but it just felt so hard. And, um, the concept of saying yes uh, had gotten to be too much. At that point, 85% of our sales were coming from the uh, retail display market. And the funny thing, when you have a market like that, everybody's deadlines are the same. Christmas comes for the same time for every one of our retailers. So no matter what we were doing, whenever we said yes, and we felt like in those days we had to, we were just stacking deadlines on top of deadlines. and. Um, it just wasn't going to be scalable. And I sort of had the realization that just because we could say yes didn't mean that we should or that 
or that it was going to be the right thing for us. At the same time, when I looked back over conversations I had had and uh, opportunities that we saw in the, in the sort of preceding 12 or 18 months, I, I saw what I can only call like a lack of loyalty, like a, a shift in some of those customers um, to a willingness to sacrifice design for price or to uh, erode the level of quality for speed, um, to shortcut innovation. And there was just increasing vocal pressure to manufacture overseas. We would have conversations, and they would say, listen, we love what you do. We want you to help us design this. But once you do, could you give your shop drawings over to one of our other vendors so they can make them? And I realized that we were um, getting a lot of respect for one part of our process, but the other part, the making of, was being made to feel like it was a commodity. And um, at, we were also sort of living in this world where because those uh, clients came from the same market, they all had the same pressure and cycles. So we ended up living in the same uh, promised lead times with those clients. So even though we were growing, our backlog wasn't growing. It was growing in dollars, but not in, in uh, duration. So even when we knew the opportunity wasn't right for us to say yes to it, we would look out eight weeks out and we had no business. So we had to say yes, we had to take things on because we still remembered and we held the scars from having to lay people off for not having enough work uh, those years ago. So it sort of all hit me during that holiday and uh, I sat down and started to pour over uh, all of our data. And one thing that I've always believed is that you have to know your business. You have to know the numbers, even if the numbers aren't something that gets you ex excited, even if you think it's uh, somebody else's job, it's the most critical thing that you can do is to know how to look at your business and understand the uh, flow of resources inside of it. And I started to get sort of nerdy, which I can do, and started to, you know, look at how many hours of engineering did we work that year and how many dollars did we ship and what's the ratio of you know, hours worked to dollars shipped and is that healthy and how many orders did that represent? And you know, I started to look at our technical products business, our shielding business, say, okay, well, is it the same equation there? Why does it feel more sustainable on that side of the business? And started to look at the uh, repetition of customer orders on that side and said, okay, well, how can we start to reinvent everything? How can we make one side of the business feel a little bit more like the other side of the business? And um, I came out of this with another uh, business plan and um, one that, that um, sort of moved us away from any of our customers that saw us as an obstacle due to uh, pricing or that we felt wasn't going to be in different economic cycles or didn't give us true diversity. And um, started to um, think about like what we had learned through the designing of the collector shelving system, the uh, initial sales, the uh, opening of American Street showroom, and came back after that holiday and got together with my uh, management team and laid out what I thought we needed to do to move the business forward, to make it feel scalable, make it feel different, to make it feel like it wasn't life or death all the time. And uh, the first and foremost was we needed to move away from retail or at least retail in the way that we were doing it. And um, we needed to increase our focus on larger scale, more complex projects, the kinds of projects that have longer lead times, that have um, a better ratio of sort of engineering to um, fabrication uh, durations and, and sales dollars. And we needed to um, find people that saw us as true partners, that wanted us in at the very beginning and wanted us there all the way at the end as a sort of a turnkey supplier. And um, we wanted to um, uh, figure out a way that we would um, distinguish ourselves in the marketplace, that we wouldn't be seen as just another factory. And uh, part of that relied on us creating our own products. And my sense at that point was that the world didn't need another table. 
uh, that we really could look more deeply. We could look at things that would be harder for other uh, companies to offer. We needed to look for things that could be uh, feel truly bespoke for our clients. This sort of white space of, of products that are hard to find, you don't know where to go to, to get them, but once you see them, you're willing to uh, sort of play with them and, and let them grow in, in the project. So we set off once again to reinvent the business and to take those lessons that we learned and to double down on this idea that creativity does drive commerce, that we needed to um, design the, ki the kinds of products that we wanted to sell and that would continue to differentiate us, make a name for Amunil in the, in the marketplace, and that would attract the types of uh, individuals, the types of employees that we needed to find that wanted to be challenged every day, that wanted to make a difference, and wanted to make uh, items that they could be proud of. And later that year, we uh, won our first award for product design from Interior Design Magazine for our collector shelving system, and we were pretty proud. And um, we were probably happier than anybody else in that room, um, and felt probably more uh, out of place than anybody else in that room but it was significant for us. And it made us a little bit more comfortable taking authorship. And um, it made some of those relationships that we were looking for with these other design firms for these larger scale projects a little bit easier because now they had maybe heard of us. Now we were showing up on their radar for where they turned to for design uh, inspiration and, and advice. And um, in 2016, we ended up publishing our first catalog. And we converted a small space in our New York sales office into something that felt a little bit more like a showroom where we could bring more of our pieces together into one space and show them to prospective clients. And then in 2016, we also won another award, this time for our uh, Brass Kitchen for best of year. Um, and that's, you know, that was sort of um, the recognition and the endorsement that that we really needed. And um, you know, when I think back about it, uh, we were super nervous. And um, we sort of thought, OK, if we are bringing out products, are we going to uh, alienate all of those architects and designers that for all of those years brought us into projects, that brought us into their clients? Um, were they going to think that we were getting sort of too big for our britches? Were we? Uh, sort of overstepping our bounds, doing stuff that they would normally be doing or that they would get paid to do. And I also thought that our retail clients would um, look at us and, and think that we were um, silly, right? Because we know better than anybody how hard they worked on design of their spaces, that how hard that they worked to uh, uh, differentiate themselves from their customer, their uh, competition. And then we also thought that uh, even though we we're going to make these sort of big, uh, cool units for our website and our catalog, we just assumed we would, smell, we would sell sort of smaller versions of them. And I was wrong about everything. And that's when you know, I sort of uh, knew that it's always better to be uh, lucky than smart. Uh, you know, the first most significant orders that we got came from retailers, retailers that we were already doing business with, retailers like Saks and Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman, and I couldn't believe it, you know, and they were so happy to do it and to support us. And the architects and designers that I was worried about alienating, it was exactly the opposite. They became our biggest advocates. They brought us to meetings. They were telling their clients how great it is they had, that we already have these products, and oh yeah, by the way, these guys can also build all these other things that we want to do that are super custom to you, to your project. And then of course, until we actually started to design sort of uh, smaller units, um, it uh, was only the big complicated units that we actually were selling. And that's when I understood sort of how important the um, authorship was going to be for us. That um, once people sort of understood our uh, design point of view, um, that they would um, come to us and ask us to um, 
have more impact, more influence over their space. So now they weren't coming to us just for the product, but they were saying, can you design this whole space? And um, they also, we started to get into these much larger, more complicated projects that we were targeting that had longer lead times. So both in these more complex products, like a kitchen, for example, you know, nobody sort of starts to think about their kitchen design eight weeks before they want to move into their home. They're thinking about it, you know, six months, a year, two years earlier. All of a sudden we're getting lead times that we never knew were possible. The same thing with these big installations. You know, a lot of times this planning starts before construction begins or before um, the spaces are, are even uh, available for demolition. And um, everything that we did helped to uh, define us. Within a few years, the composition of sales had become exactly what we were hoping for. Um, as the growth from our sort of Amunil design products started to replace uh, our retail clients, started to replace those clients that weren't valuing what we could bring to the market, um, we started to uh, say yes to a different type of, of project, a type of uh, project that we were really aiming for. And these were ones that uh, would stretch us, would challenge us. Um, clients would approach us and they would say, hey, listen, we're, we have this idea, but we need you to help inform materials or the design or you know, figure out how to support a project structurally. And we're like, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we want to do. You know, or, or clients would come to us and they'd have designs, but they just didn't know the materials or textures. They wanted finishes that would feel like their brand. And we would set off and we'd start to experiment and, and, and come up with these sort of bespoke uh, techniques to create finishes that would be specific to them. And we got to the point where we would get, you know, I could get a text message on a Saturday from a, uh, an architect with an inspiration image. And they would say, hey, this is, you know, the inspiration, we want to do this kind of space, it's this many square feet, can you come up with an idea and a budget, we need to present it next week. And we really became an extension of their team. Uh, and these large scale projects uh, pushed us and stretched us and forced us to dig deeper than we ever had. Um, we had to reinvent our engineering approach. We had to uh, build a bigger bag of tricks. Um, we had to invest in equipment, building our own sometimes, learning new processes. And, um, but every time we did, we were able to take that to the next project. Every uh, successful project informed and supported the one that would come next. And it's amazing, you know, we get to tour these, you know, we go to different cities, we'll tour these sites. And, you know, I think about these, you know, here's little Aminil, this little company in the, you know, in uh, Northeast Philadelphia. And I'm standing on a, you know, feature staircase that we built for the Empire State Building where four or five million people a year will walk up and down. They'll never know who we were, um, but we got to do it. You know, or I think about the millions of people that will come and go at uh, LaGuardia Airport a year uh, that will see the new, ins the new uh, sculpture that we just installed for Sarah Z. And it's just, you know, it's just so humbling uh, that we get to have these opportunities, ignite this uh, sort of uh, creative spirit, have something that sort of works within the context of running and driving a business um, and still keeps and inspires our, our people. And um, so during the holiday between uh, the end of 2018 and the start of 2019, we decided that we would um, really go for it in New York. And we took our sales office and we um, decided to renovate it and make a, a showroom for ourselves. And uh, I was excited because we had our first visitor even before we were done construction. Uh, it, was a, it was a designer that I had become friendly with because that's sort of how the world works now. I become friendly with her through Instagram. We'd never met, but she wanted to bring her team because she had a project that she thought we would be a good fit for. And I was, um, I remember being there was just the beginning, the first working day in January when we came back and we were excited. We were there. We styled the showroom, cleaned it up. We had food, of course, and she came in. And she just started sort of walking sort of uh, feverishly through the space. And she was um, raving 
uh, about the work and she was telling me how great it was, which we love to hear, but she's also sort of berating me. And she's saying, what, what the hell are you guys doing here? Who's gonna see you in this uh, nondescript office building? It's like, if you're serious about these products, if you want people to see them, if you want people to know who you are, you've got to get into one of the design centers. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, God, well, you found us. And I'm also thinking we just finished construction. You know, like we're, we just got done. But she was insistent. And through a series of meetings that she uh, set up for us and uh, talking to other designers that she Citizen put us in touch with, it became clear that we needed to take another risk. And even though we had, you know, been open for just a couple months in that space, we started construction on a 5,000 square foot space at the New York Design Center, you know, eight blocks away. And um, it was obviously unplanned. Uh, it was another one of these risks that you um, get more and more confident taking based on the success or failure of risks that have come before it. Um, but it has been a game changer for us, sort of once again. And um, it's provided us a steady flow, honestly, of people who either had seen us but didn't understand what the full complement of what we could do, or people who had never heard of us, that couldn't believe you know, that we even existed, and that we have to still pronounce our name for two or three or four times until they get it. But in the meantime, they're designing these, you know, sort of brilliant projects, you know, with our products in them. And, um, you know, during this uh, pandemic, quite frankly, the uh, orders and projects that came out of clients that we had met through the showroom uh, is what kept our sort of order flow so, so uh, healthy and, and made us to, so fortunate. This year, you know, it's a super strange year for everybody, and it's our 55th uh, year in business. And when I look back, the ethos of the business has never changed, not since my parents founded the, the company. You know, it's always been personal, we've always been scrappy, and we've always continued to take risks. But our businesses, you know, and the offerings have continued to evolve. And I know that even at uh, 55 years in business, I know that in five years, when I look back, we'll look completely different again. There'll be another evolution that we won't stand still. And I attribute sort of this confidence to um, creative thinking and to seeing these problems or opportunities as sort of a catalyst to drive forward, to push forward, to not give up. And um, you know, we think this way in every aspect of the business and on, in every market that we serve. This isn't sort of carved out just for what we do with our architects and design clients. We're forced just as often to be as creative um, and to take as many risks on the technical product side of our business. And, um, you know, when I think about all of the problems that have been solved over the years, and all of the things we've done, and I think about the fact that we now ship in two and a half weeks what we used to ship in, my, in a whole year when I first started, I know that even though we make mistakes, tons of them along the way, it's just continuing to push and explore and reevaluate that changes everything. And um, when I was sort of thinking about, you know, today in this presentation, I started to think about this idea that um, design is a verb you know, it's the actions that we take to address these challenges that we face or opportunities that people put in front of us. Um, but it's also a noun. It's the tangible evidence, the, the manifestation of the um, creative actions that we took. And whether it's, you know, a new plant layout or developing a new finish or coming up with a new kitchen design, um, you know, our history has been uh, continually influenced by the um, challenges that came before. The more successful the preceding uh, sort of challenges have been, the more successful the solutions have been, the more successful the designs have been, the more willing we are to take the next risk. And sometimes it's a series of small successes along the way, little opportunities or little challenges and navigating them 
that gives you the ability to take a bigger risk and a bigger step forward. And sometimes it's a big hairy one that goes terribly wrong that you learn from. So when you make your next uh, attempt, you, are, you temper it a bit. You try to solve it in smaller chunks rather than one big chunk. But whatever we've done and however successful we've been, it would be a huge uh, miss on my part if I didn't recognize the uh, critical contribution of the individuals that I currently work with and all the people at Amunil that came before that um, have always been the ones that, that kept us going, kept us afloat. We've always been willing to invest in equipment and technology, but more than anything, it's our employees who have uh, fueled our intellectual curiosity, that drive the creative thinking and a belief that uh, things can be better. You know, they do the heavy lifting, not just the physical and the thoughtful uh, work, but they offer the flexibility. They sort of expose themselves to vulnerability to try new things, to stretch and to allow us to grow. And if it hadn't been for their trust in us and their trust in me, their belief that we've always been capable of more, uh, if it hadn't been for their absolute courage and generosity, then none of these projects that we've ever attempted, let alone completed, could ever have happened. And I sometimes think that we make our uh, living in the most complicated way possible, but I always, always feel fortunate to have been given and earned the opportunities that got us here today. So thank you. <laughs>